Welcome to another edition of Spiritual Encounters, and I'm your lion-hearted host, Pastor Casper, and I'm really excited about tonight's show because we've got Stan Dale with us, and uh, he's uh, just one of the most amazing men I've listened to. He's um, a lecturer and an author. He's had uh, held above top secret security clearance and worked undercover for the FBI. He's done, you name it, I think he's done it already. Um, he was specializing in helping develop flying saucer technology. So, Stan, welcome to the program tonight. Thank you. Good to be here, Casper. Um, so de- sorry, go ahead. So delighted to have you, and uh, I've got uh, tons of questions. <laughs> Is that all? Just tons. All right. Just well, tons. Yeah. We can so, handle that. So we've got a spirit of fear, you know, that's operating. It's projecting itself into thoughts and about the future, of how this world's going, and I think many people are really knowingly, unknowingly entertaining the spirit of fear, concerned how maybe the end of 2016 is going to play out. Um, maybe they've forgotten that the Lord has a divine plan and always outmaneuvers whatever the devil attempts. So um, I think it's really important we don't accept those kind of poisonous imaginations that, you know, fear a future. So I want to really just put that up front before we really dive into this, because I know we might talk about some things that might seem a bit fearful to people. Um, it just, you know, that stuff has such a far-reaching consequence on people's physical health and life and well-being. So um, again, I'm going to cling to um, 2 Corinthians 10.5, you know, casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to be into Christ. So... Um, I mean, you've done some amazing things. You, you've. How did you become interested in things like, the, you know, finding the location of the Golden Eden, the flying saucer technology, Atlantis, the, you know, exploring the flood of Noah, the Tower of Babel. We've got the earthquakes rising, the Ring of Fire. I mean, let's just jump jump in wherever you feel comfortable. Well, gosh, um, the. Um uh, the flying saucer thing, uh, very briefly, I got recruited uh, for that uh, back in uh, Dallas, Texas in 1971. And I was taken uh, down to Australia to be part of Dr. Edward Teller's uh, project. That was He was joined in that by Dr. Andrei Sakharov of uh, Russia uh, and uh, by leading scientists in uh, England, and the United Kingdom, New Zealand, and Australia, and a couple of other places. They set up after uh, having made contact with uh, what they called aliens, um, fallen ones, uh, they set up a research project to build underground secret bases where they could get technology from these beings and also could uh, manufacture and develop our own technology based on that. Um, that took me to Australia, as I said, in 71. In 73, I left the organization because it was in chaos at that point in time. We came to a disagreement uh, the, uh, my controller, Captain Sir John Williams, and I about what I could say publicly about what we were holding back. And at the same time, uh, without going into a lot of detail, I found out that the these alien critters they were talking about were starting to move us out of our bases. There was conflicts at, at a number of our bases, and they were kicking the humans out. Reason being that they had uh, developed the technology uh, to manufacture what they needed for weapons and other things without our help any longer. They didn't bring all that with them when they came through from the, I guess, the parallel universe, you'd say, around us. Anyway, that's what got me started on a very long trek. And uh, in 1979, I appeared on a uh, television documentary in Perth, Western Australia, doing a show on the cover-up and how flying saucers worked, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually it led to a book the following year and... I don't know, a quarter of a million copies sold in 22 countries. In fact, it's still selling. Um, And that put me on to, you know, the Internet and the radio and various other things in the media, which kind of pressed me to find things to talk about that were current events and also in keeping with biblical prophecy. Like you said at the start of the show, a lot of this stuff, uh, the events that are happening now and in the last 20 years have been gradually, you know, potentially causing people to be frightened, and I was trying to explain to them why not to be frightened, and it was all part of God's plan. Now, in 2014, I was asked to do a couple of lectures 
by a, a group up in a, a church group up in Colorado Springs. So I started looking around for something to talk about, and I had written a book back in '89 about where the Garden of Eden would be and uh, where Atlantis would have been. And I, you know, I didn't have access to all the internet and NASA satellite imagery I have now, so I came close, but I didn't quite nail either one of them. And I realized that when I was looking back for things to talk about from that book for the lectures I was planning. And so now that I had Google Earth, the Earth Pro thing, which allowed me to do a lot more things than I could with just normal Google Earth, I started looking at the Far Triangle, um, just in, up near the Gulf of Aden, because that was named after Eden. And I thought, well, let me see if I can at least find you know where they might have lived and where the, how they were kept in that area, Adam and Eve, uh, you know, at, at the uh, at the garden. And I couldn't find it. I mean, I went all over looking at river flows and land, uh, you know, buildups and everything. And I thought, this just doesn't feel right. And I looked at where the, all the water came from to make the the waterways in the the Afar Triangle, you know, um, uh, right there at. Uh, the junction of, of the Red Sea and the Arabian Sea, the uh, Aden Gulf. And I found that the water came from uphill up in, you know, up through Ethiopia and up into Tanzania. I followed this river a mile by mile, you know, way up there on the Google Earth. And I came to where all these four rivers, or three of the four rivers came from that came down there. And I thought, hmm, not four rivers, but three. Well, where did they come from? And they came from, it looked like a big volcano, an extinct volcano that had collapsed up close to where Kilimanjaro is. And I started digging around, and I found that there were actually four rivers that came out of that place. Only three of them came down and into the uh, uh, Great East African Rift, which is what I'd gone up to, you know, from the Afar Triangle up that way. And um, I, I started getting excited. I thought, well, this, this is a natural garden because it's a crater that's got walls all around. It's the only intact crater like this in the world. It's 100 square miles. It's got trees, animals, all kinds of large game animals and stuff and small birds and water flows. And I thought, this is it. So the more I investigated it, the more I translated the Hebrew, I found out that it definitely was the Garden of Eden. And the land of Eden was west of there near Lake Victoria. Well, in fact, that included all Lake Victoria because that whole area is surrounded by a series of lakes and volcanic ridges that form another natural border to what was Eden. Uh, and, of course, as the Bible uh, story goes, the Adam and Eve um, ate of the tree of uh, uh, knowledge they shouldn't have. They were taken out. They were dressed and taken out of the Garden of Eden to start to procreate and have their sons and daughters. And that occurred mm, probably, well, within 100 to 200 miles of there where they started um, settling and having children. Oddly enough, I found that the um, biologists of the world have recently, or had recently in 2014, discovered that all of the races of humans they could find, they had a mitochondrial uh, DNA structure that led back to one physical point on the world where all the races originated from. And that was in the Omo Valley, which, of course, is yeah. two, or three, two or 300 miles of the Ngoro Crater where I was uh, for the Garden of Eden. And one was thing that, after another. Was Sorry, that go on. Uh, wasn't that discovery something maybe in the seventies when they came out with that? I, I can't remember that. Um, but well, it may have been. But I was looking at more modern reports on it okay. um, that they were endorsing it and saying they'd found uh, you know hominid remains that uh, proved that. Right. And the Leakey's discovery it was only five miles outside the Ngoro crater, and uh, that was the oldest hominid bones they'd found. So all of it points back to there. And even the local legends of one of the, uh, not the Maasai, but uh, another tribe, I forget their name, they they stayed around the Ngoro Crater, which was the Garden of Eden, for, gosh, I think maybe two, three, about two, nearly two and a half to 3,000 years they were there. And then the Maasai, Maasai moved in and they moved north. But this tribe, in their legend, says that uh, God came down into the, the uh, Ngoro crater built man, put man outside, and then God went up into the air, back into the heavens, and left. So they even call one little mountain, which is a volcano that's still active outside the edge of the Ngoro crater, the Mountain of God. And it's still the only one of its kind erupting, 
constantly. It's it's a natron volcano, which is half the temperature of normal volcanoes, but it puts out a lot of uh, soda uh, ash and stuff. And in essence, about 13% of it is the same stuff you'd find in Alka-Seltzer tablets. But it makes beautiful silver bubbles that break and uh, they fall down and form this salty residue that's washed down into a lake uh, just downstream from the Ngoro crater. And it's a, you know, a, a natron lake. I think they may even call it Lake Natron in the area. But that was the Garden of Eden. And uh, I followed the migration path down from there, down the Great East African Rift, and even into the Saudi Peninsula. Now, at the time, I found out that um, when the Garden of Eden was built, that the continents were all together, that Pangaea, where all the continents were together, was intact at that time. And I thought, well, how can this be? How can it be that the land of Nod, which was India, could be directly east of the Garden of Eden in Tanzania unless they were all connected you know, together at the time? And that would have been only maybe six, seven 9,000 years, depending on which book you use to count the age of you know, the Garden of Eden and now. And uh, I, I started studying and found out that there's a growing weight of evidence and papers being written about the era that physicists have made and geologists have made about dating the age of the Earth, the Sun, and the, and the, uh, the whole universe. And it all stems back to a very simple concept, the density of space and how fast light travels in space coupled with the density of it. It's like this. If I talk to you in a room, speaking my voice through air, it will reach your ears at 1,100 feet per second. If I were to connect to your ear with a bar of nickel, solid nickel, which is much more dense than air, and I were to broadcast my sound waves into that, it would get to you five times faster at around 5,500 feet per second. So the more dense, the faster the wave travels in the medium. Now, light is an electromagnetic wave. So they're saying that when the Big Bang occurred, the whole universe was crammed down into this very, very, very little tiny spot. So it starts to expand. Well, light and all other electromagnetic radiation was traveling a lot faster then, and that continued to slow down over the the years. And it wasn't 100 or 500 or 15 billion years. It was in a matter of less than 100,000 years, probably less than 50,000 years, that the universe expanded out to where it is now and started to slow down. It's like, boom, and it was very fast, very fast, slowing down, slowing down, slow. So the speed of light now is slow compared to where it was in the beginning. And the the difference in speed is like uh, 10 with 30 zeros after it, faster at the Big Bang than it is now. That led me to understand then that what we thought was 100 million years ago when the Pangaea, you know, the massive continent of land on the Earth, broke up to form the continents, that's not so. And then I thought, well, okay, I can see why. I, I've discovered the Garden of Eden. I did my lecture and talked to a bunch of people about it. And a year or two, a year and a half passed, I guess, and I got invited to do a lecture, a couple of lectures, this year, later in the year in the middle of July in Colorado Springs. So I had to make another lecture. So I went back to my lecture notes on the Garden of Eden, and I thought, well, I'll update this a bit, and you know, and then I'll find a new, a new topic beyond that. While I was looking at Google Earth and the, the separation of the continents, I made a huge discovery, huge. I was looking at India, which had obviously been moved from its place next to the east coast of Africa by something. When I gave my lecture in 2014, I said there was a meteor over the hit over in the Gulf of Mexico on the uh, Yucatan Peninsula called the Chicxulub meteor, and it impacted, and the shock wave that went through the Earth bounced off the core and went up and kicked India up to form the, the Himalayas, and that was the cause of the eventual breakup of Pangaea. Not so, not so. I started looking at the the footprint in the mud of India before it was separated from Africa, and I thought its west coast was caved in originally to fit around Madagascar and Africa, but now it's bowed out the other direction. What, what would have caused that? And I looked over on the east coast of India, and I found a crater 
300 miles in diameter offshore and going in, inland into the uh, southeastern part of India. So I looked it up. And in the last maybe 10 years, people have started to say, you know, this area that we call the Kudapa Basin may actually have been formed by, well, a subsidence of Earth, but maybe it could have been formed by a meteor, but we can't find the center of it. Well, that was my clue. I thought, right. This meteor is 300 miles in diameter. The Chicks Love meteor was maybe 100 miles in diameter, the crater, right? The crater right. of these two. But the energy of the impact of the one in India would have been over 22 times that of the one that was in the Gulf of Mexico. Well, that was astounding. I thought, well, why can't we see in the mud maps there uh, off the, in the Bay of Bengal, why can't we see the rest of the crater? Then I looked at it and I thought, right. When this thing hit, it was a shallow hit. It hit at a very shallow angle and not straight down. So it went underneath India, and in the the shock wave of it going down underneath and pulling mass out from under India and shoving it over toward the North Atlantic, this would have made a, a splash that went up and back and shoved India over where it is today. But that would have moved the east coast of India up from where the impact occurred. So it went down south of Ceylon on the southern tip of India, and I found there's an impact area there. That's where the crater actually hit and entered underneath India to do the damage it did over toward the North Atlantic. And as India moved up, the only thing that moved with it on land was the ridge of that 300-mile uh, diameter crater, but not the rest of the crater, just the, the ridge that was on land. So I found that, and I've, that's the biggest meteor impact to date that we've had got on record, and I can I can confirm that now and explain why it's where it is in part in another part. That's really quite ex um, astounding. And you know, as you were explaining that, I kind of remembered as as a small child looking at a map of the world, um, kind of being a trained artist for years. You know, but I was only maybe eight years old or something, and it looked to me like all all the land was one big mass at one point and broke apart because just the way the shapes were. And um, I remember commenting on it to uh, the teacher at the time who told me that was preposterous. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I'm so glad you validated it after all these years. I know. And there have been people that have said, yeah, this happened, but it was a gradual thing over hundreds of millions, well, over 100 million mm -hmm. years of the continent just kind of drifted an inch per year. I'm saying no. When a meteor that big strikes and causes that much damage, it moves catastrophically continents apart and um, that's what happened and it slowed down now to a few inches per year but that's that's now back when it first occurred the, the separation was pretty rapid even an egyptian pharaoh uh, mentioned it uh, or it was written down about him complaining about the earth moaning and groaning in mm -hmm. belikovsky's uh, work but um, anyway that that meteor did a couple of really spectacular things it, it altered the face of the middle east and it altered the North Atlantic, where the bulge of that meteor came out. It didn't. It didn't come out, but it shoved underneath uh, the Saudi Arabia area, underneath Europe, and uh, uh, and the bulge. It stopped beneath the surface of the Earth, but the bulge it pushed up in the North Atlantic. You can see this was over two million square miles in area, and that's what caused that great massive bulge there along the great, uh, you know, uh, Africa or sorry, Atlantic Ridge down the, the middle of the ocean there. Now, what did it do to history? Well, first of all, when it impacted, it threw up steam and water up into the upper atmosphere where it met colder air in space or the edge of space, and it condensed and became rain. But it didn't do that in a matter of a few minutes. It did it over several weeks. As the Bible records that it was 40 days that rain fell day and night, flooding the area where Noah had lived. And the other thing they said was that the fountains of the deep were broken open and they made hot water and stuff come up into the, the ocean to help with the flooding. When a meteor impacts a planet, especially one with water, it does cause steam, it does heat up the water, it does break up the lower levels of the, the crust, you know, the mantle, which is exactly what they said in the Hebrew. Hmm. So that was the cause of the flood. Um, and I must tell you that there is evidence that there were small pockets of people on the other side of the planet and in uh, North Africa that did survive the flood. But this is not in contrast to what is said in Genesis and Hebrew. 
the word that the author used, and I say the author because there are at least two authors that put together Genesis. You can see that in the writing styles. The, the word for earth is Eretz, and at the time, the word was used uh, in, in Genesis was used for red earth, and that's Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula's red earth. And there's one place where it says, and the ark was lifted above the earth, or above Ha'eretz. Well, the earth didn't go into, or uh, sorry, the, the ark didn't go into orbit. It was lifted up above the red earth, the red earth, or dirt. So the flood was, I'm pretty sure, local, and there were a couple of giants, you know, the, the, the Nephilim crossbreeds that survived. And I'm pretty sure that's why God had the uh, Israel in the Exodus when Joshua came into the Promised Land. That's why he had them murder uh, people and and uh, their children and their animals and every living thing in certain villages in the promised land in the land of Canaan because they were remnants that were not wiped out in the flood. They were the bad genes of the crossbreeding between off-worlders and us. Anyway, that's another issue. Now, the thing I have found out recently is that not only did the flood bury, you know, uh, what was uh, the, the land that Noah lived in, it also buried Atlantis. There was a real Atlantis, and I found it. Uh, it took a few weeks, maybe six weeks, to get all the pieces together. But Atlantis, that people mostly talk about, is the capital of Atlantis, a little series of circular moats and a, and a, uh, the, a the hill. The ones near, near Cuba and the Bermuda Triangle, um, that, that part of it? Or you, you're talking about no, it no, further no. out? Now, understand that what Plato talked about did allow for other advanced beings to build and, and colonize other parts of the earth when it was all one piece. But what he talked about was Poseidon, who took you know what became known as Atlantis. That was his section. Mm -hmm. So in South and Central America and pyramids there and other things, I have no doubt that there were advanced beings there. Uh, they died out somehow else in the flood or whatever. But um, so that what they're seeing off Cuba may have been part of the extremities of some advanced culture. But the one spoken of, of as Atlantis, let's think about that. May, well, actually, they, they could have made a settlement uh, through the, the Straits of Gibraltar when everything was together and the uh, Central American stuff was connecting over to Europe and, and to the Mediterranean. Uh, but they didn't go far. They, they had reached out their empire through the Mediterranean, and we're almost uh, starting to settle outside the, uh, the case of Gibraltar. But the main island, the, the capital island, is on the west side of the Persian Gulf. There are five sites that I've picked so far there that are very potential by size and by ring structures and whatever. Most of them are underwater, but you can see parts of them. That's the capital. That part sank, and so did the whole Saudi Peninsula. When the meteor impacted, it dropped the southern part, south, uh, southeastern part of the Saudi Peninsula, it dropped it by 1,600 feet when it knocked the slats out from under it and shoved it up under the Atlantic. It raised the northwest part of it up where the Mediterranean is about the same amount, maybe a little bit more, but, but close. Now, at that same time, the Earth used to be rotating vertically. The impact shifted our spin axis 23 and a half degrees, which is why we have the seasons now. It tilted us from this huge impact. And you can certainly do the math on that or even visually look and see where the meteor hit and how it, 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 it with the Earth spinning toward the sun, how it would have bounced and caused that shift uh, of the North Pole. The North Pole used to be up near Iceland, and uh, now it's you know where it is, drifting around the, uh, the Arctic Ocean area there. Anyway, that's what caused all that. And the island of Atlantis, the real island, the big one, was over 1.3 million square miles. Uh, Plato said that, and people skip over that, but he said the area of it was as much as uh, uh, Asia Minor, and of, um, oh, I've gone blank, Libya, ancient Libya on the uh, Mediterranean coast going up to Gibraltar. So when you mark out those areas and combine the area of ancient Libya and of Asia Minor at the time, it's about 1.3 million square miles. So the island size is correct. Then I had to find 
what they call the rectangular plain. It was 110 miles wide, 330 miles long, in the middle of the main island. I had to go to NASA and get their 3D imaging, high-resolution high imaging of the Saudi Peninsula. And in there, I found three sides of the rectangle where they had, in the time of Atlantis, they had dug trenches around it, in rectangular trenches, to funnel the water flow from the mountains down and around the whole fertile plain and into uh, the sea, which is, uh, the, the Persian Gulf is still part of that, just even though the upper part of it's dry now. Mm-hmm. That, that we found. And I've, using Google Earth again and getting down underneath, you know, the, the large pictures, getting down to the high-res pictures, I have found over 1,700 stone monuments and artifacts that these people left. And the Bedouin tribes say that these were made by the old men the men of the old time, and that was the Atlanteans. There's um, um, gold. They needed to have a particular metal. Plato talked about this mystery metal, or a calcum, that they were able to beat out. It's very malleable. And coat stones and stone walls and, and stone streets in the capital with this or a calcum metal, which was a reddish gold color in the sunlight. Well, looking at metallurgy and all the alloys that, that float around, the most malleable with that red uh, tint is gold with 14% copper alloy. Now, where would they get the gold and the copper? Well, they must have mined a lot of it. To my surprise, near Jeddah, just inland from Jeddah on the west coast, of, or, or on the east coast of the Red Sea, but on the kind of westish coast of uh, the Arabic Peninsula, there is a huge mining complex. Last couple of years, I think it took a million ounces of gold out of it. And the, the primary uh, mineral or metal sources in their mind there, which has been operating since 3000 B.C., believe it or not, was gold, the copper, and silver. They had the makings of what they needed to make this mystery metal or a calcum. And in the Greek, calcus is copper, and uh, aura, they think, meant, uh, aura meant uh, the mountain, the mountain copper. May well have been, that's what they found over in Spain and around that area, uh, and, and the Romans adopted that as the meaning. But if it was mountain copper, it was because it was reddish. The real orichalca was oro gold and calcus ca- uh, copper. And that uh, is being mined. And today, the uh, deputy, well, actually the whole family, the, Sa- the Salman family who rule uh, Saudi Arabia now, have uh, since 2012 given mining rights to a company that is mining offshore of Jeddah there and uh, in between Jeddah and uh, Sudan. They've made contracts with both countries to mine the gold and copper from underneath the Red Sea there. It, it is it is an amount measured in tons of gold, lots of tons of gold there, very rich. So I'm pretty sure that all these things add up to Atlantis was there and finding the key geographic features and finding, oh, I found the lost uh, Straits of Hercules. Everyone thought that the Rock of Gibraltar there, the Straits of Gibraltar, were the, the, uh, the uh, well, the gateways, uh, the pillars of Hercules that, that Plato spoke about. But there are two references to uh, uh, Hercules uh, and the gates in Plato's account. And one account says the Straits of Hercules, and the other says the pillars of Hercules. And I don't think Plato made a mistake. There's the pillars which we know of in the Mediterranean, but the straits were joining two large seas. It's a narrow straight way of water that joins two large seas. The Mediterranean used to empty between the, uh, there's, it's like a strait of, of, of way of water at the, the borderline between Syria and Turkey. And you'll see there in the Mediterranean, there's two large structures um, uh, like mountains coming up. And in between them, you sailed in between them and around a curve and, and then left again, and you were into a larger ocean. The Straits had led, the Straits of Hercules were there, and they led into the what's, what's uh, the original Persian Gulf was the, the Atlantic Sea at that time. And they just misnomered what we call the Atlantic today, uh, you know, not knowing any difference. But so there were two. This goes along with our Genesis 6 uh, accounts of um, which... It's probably where you know the fallen angels sleeping with the daughters of man and producing the Nephilim. So um, you, you're seeing that kind of play out as well on this uh, the bigger picture here, which is where we got all the Greek mythology from. 
Yes, yes. You know, uh, if you look at the origin of cattle, for instance, in our cattle herds, every bovine that we have on the planet, their genetic uh, DNA code is traced back to an original herd of 80 cattle in the center of Saudi Arabia and a little bit toward the, the Persian Gulf, closer to her, the bottom part of Iran. That mm-hmm. was where the Atlanteans were. They were the ones that worshipped the bull. I mean, even they, they had an outreach over into uh, the Minoan culture uh, and uh, it, it saw the Mediterranean up a bit there. And on the frescoes they've got, they show bull tossing and bull riding and horn jumping as an exercise of young men. And it's much like what Plato described that the Atlanteans were good at. And the young men would charge the bull and the bull would charge them. And because of the shape of the horns being kind of a bow shape, like the oryx today, they would grab a horn in each hand as they hit them and flip upside down and over and bounce off the, the bull's back end to the ground and prove their manhood and all this kind of stuff. But the Atlantean culture worshipped the bull for some reason, and that's where genetic evidence shows that every cow on the earth had its origin, was right there in the middle of what was Atlantis. And get this, get this, mm. that mining area that I told you about in the Red Sea, that they've signed the contracts, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia and Sudan with to have this, this company take them out. You know what they're calling that, that, that dig? At the, at, the Atlantis Two Deeps Mine. That's Atlantis amazing. Two. Yeah. And what are they building over on the coast near Dubai? The Atlantis Resort. It's there, in fact. It's ready. The Atlantis Resort. Do you see this kind of coming together um, as uh, an end-time scenario with maybe full disclosure? I mean, it's interesting that we can see so many people in history have eyewitness accounts. Um, For example, we had lots of people watching the assassination of President Kennedy, right? Um, There's actual footage. It's gone over all the people that saw the the two planes hit uh, the two towers and take down three towers. Um, We've got all these eyewitness accounts, and yet after all the investigation, we can't get people to agree on the facts. Um, As well as, you know, we've got over 500 people that that Jesus resurrected, Jesus Christ and Nazareth appeared to, and only 120 obeyed and stayed in the upper room. So... Um, we're looking at all these things playing out. How do you see this? Um, I, I, I sense you don't really want to talk about the UFO thing too much, but um, oh, since you did touch, know. well, since you did touch on that in the beginning of the program, I think our listeners would probably benefit um, by understanding how this is playing out and how do you perceive this coming to a head right now? I mean, how could people best prepare their hearts for what's coming? The Lord says, means hearts failing them for fear. What What's coming? We've got Second Thessalonians talking about lying signs and wonders, and um, why why the cover up? I mean, you were really involved in it at a level most people couldn't imagine getting that close. So I know maybe whatever you you're safe to elaborate on. I don't want to put you in any awkward position here, but no, you I I don't. I, I'm I'm not uh, frightened of these things. I mean, I I nearly died in '69 with an illness I had. That was before I even went down there, and. Uh, uh, since that time, I haven't really been afraid of death, and uh, the Lord had his hand on me for a different reason, and I suppose that's what I'm doing now. Now, the, the, the UFO stuff or the, the, the joint venture we had with those beings ended in the mid to late 70s as our bases were taken over and we were kicked out. The technology at that time, I, I, I knew that we had a base, guess where, in Saudi Arabia, 120 miles outside of Riyadh in the Jabal Tuwaik mountain range buried underneath it. It was the most secret base we had, better than Pine Gap, better than Area 51, whatever. This was where the aliens were, and you know, their, their main headquarters. Now, it's odd that they would go back and reclaim uh, a portion of Saudi Arabia, which was ancient Atlantis. They have returned. Even Linda Moulton, how the UFO reporter, said that she heard, and I talked to her about this, when she was in the Pentagon, she heard the generals she was talking with were murmuring things like, the Sumerian gods have returned, meaning Mm -hmm. in that area of of Atlantis in the Arabian uh, desert there. Underneath the sands of the desert, um, you know, is the evidence, major cities and settlements and forests that have been petrified and covered over by sand since the great flood and the impact 
but they are there. And even T.E. Lawrence, you know, Lawrence of Arabia, he was an author as well. He wrote in one of his books about the Atlantis of the sands, the lost city somewhere under the sand that the Bedouins talk about. So it is well known. And the technology, I think, will center around there for a very good reason. The leader of the world, the new Antichrist, will come from that area. I know it doesn't sound like it would from some descriptions, but the leader will be um, an Arabian. He will probably be from the tribe of Dan, and the Salman family that rules now do have links back to a Jewish merchant in, I think it was Iraq, you know, years ago. And most of the indigenous Arabians don't like the Salman family because they aren't really Arabian in their in their impression. They think they may be Jewish, you know, in their roots. Certainly, if that's true, the the family has gone against the god of their fathers. But they there's a a son. The son of King Solomon is Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And I want you to remember this and your listeners to remember this. Mohammed bin Salman. It's Solomon. And in the Revelation, in the, uh, the chapter speaking about here is wisdom, 666, here's the, it's the number of a man. It was pointing you back toward King Solomon who earned 666 talents of gold a year. It, Solomon was the wise one. And his name... Uh, uh, Arabized is Solomon. And even King Solomon himself, when his mother asked King David to change his name to what it is now, she did that uh, because she had been married to Uriah the Hittite, and their great hero was a king that had lived about 300 years before in the area, Shalmaneser, or Shalman the Great. And uh, that's Solomon. Uh, it became Anglicanized so that Solomon, Shloma of Israel, and Shalman. Esser of the Arabic legends became Solomon uh, and the knights, you know, the, the tales of jinns and flying carpets and stuff pertain primarily to him. But that's why that area is important. And um, the the young fellow, uh, this, this Prince Solomon, if you take the first letters of his name, uh, they, they do this in the uh, Arabic court. His cousin is going to be king when King Solomon passes, which may be shortly, it looks like. So Prince Solomon will remain a prince because he's in charge of the military and economics and all kinds of stuff. He's doing that already without even being king. But his cousin is Mohammed bin Nayef, N-A-Y-E-F. So to separate the two Mohammeds, when people are talking about them in the court, one is called M-B-N, Mohammed bin Nayef, and one is called M-B-S, Mohammed bin Solomon. Now, why is that important? Because young bin Salman has formed a consortium of 39 Arabic nations already, and he's uh, the chairman of the uh, the Gulf Cooperation States of Arabs. There's six of them in that. And his forming this Arabic union gives you five letters, three consonants and two vowels, M-A-B-U-S. Check with what Nostradamus said about the coming Antichrist. He also said he would have a blue headpiece, a blue fez, a blue turban, a blue headpiece. And young Prince Solomon has changed lately from a black rope around his towel head thing to a dark cobalt blue one. He has a mean temper behind the scenes. They try to keep that out. He, but he is very, like, handsome. He's very, very, very wealthy. And... Uh, as, as popular polls run in the Arab states over in the Middle East, he is their number one favorite to be ruler of an Arabic union. Now, we know that the Saudi Arabians were behind funding part of the terrorists, or maybe all of them, that went to hit nine, you know, hit the, the Twin Towers in 9-11. Right now, the Saudis are saying to the White House, if you release the file on 9-11 implicating us, you know, we're going to do bad things to you economically. Now, uh, the rumor is that Saudi Arabia, and of course it's not a rumor, it's proven, um, you know, funded Osama bin Laden. They funded what is now ISIS. And so when they pull the plug on the funding to the terrorist organizations of the world at the discretion of this guy, it will make him a hero because all the nations will say, look, look, he stopped these terrorists. You know, what a great fella. Mm. So keep your eye on him. I could be totally wrong. 
totally wrong. But of all of the six major candidates that we've put on our, our dartboard here, been studying, this fellow is coming to the front, and you'll see him more in the news and more with the technology. You're talking about this this flying saucer stuff. I think we're going to see him get technology from the aliens to do exactly what the Bible says, to cause fire to come down from the heavens in the sight of men, just like King Solomon did when he dedicated the, the first temple. And he so, may also... Sorry? So we're looking at more lying signs and wonders, is what the scriptures say. Yes, uh, yes, yes. I, I would have to just interject. You said something about Nostradamus. Is um, I mean, him being an occultist, um, it, it's interesting, but I, I wouldn't, you know, obviously validate that when we've got something reliable like the Holy Scriptures here. Absolutely, it, it, absolutely. So I just want to yeah. clarify that for our listeners. And and not only that, yeah, I mean. Um, the devil does uh, reveal to his prophets certain things to try to gain credibility among the people he deceives. And that's what I'm saying is uh, the fact that Nostradamus would say this about this guy, and we have the other proofs from the scripture that, that point to this guy. They both so, are, are admitting it. So how, how does this all play in? As you see, we only have a few minutes left, and we've got the, the hybrid program in place um, with the abductions and um, – the technology, I mean, is it, this is really back to, you know, are women for technology again? Um, is it just the same thing playing out? How do you see that unfolding here before us so in, in the near future? I'm sorry, could you kind of ask that question again? I went Okay, so but in back in Genesis um, 6, we've got this account. Um, yeah. It almost seemed like an exchange. Yeah. Um, are, are women for the technology? The You know, the Nephilim came from this. Um, and we're seeing that play out now. There's too many reports of a hybrid program in place yes. with all the abductions. Um, that that why is the government holding the secret um, when they have the, the disclosure in Washington in 2013? And you you know you've got the, um, the Minister of Defense, former Minister of Defense Paul Hillier, coming out admitting that he knows of extraterrestrials working in the U.S. government and that sort of thing. And then he goes on Moscow telev- uh, television. Sophie and company tells us even more strange stuff. Um, so obviously all this, you know, for anybody that's new to this, <laughs> this is all kind of unfolding. So how, but how do you see this um, playing out at the moment? And just this- Well, I, I agree with you. Look, uh, the release of the technology, the admitting that they're here, you know, by, by Paul Hillier and others in high places uh, in the military, whatever, is part of a, uh, a program release of the information but these people who have kept this secret and have gained technology and, and power, you know, beyond our wildest dreams, they are, are in essence traitors to us. They've sold the human race out. And when uh, the devil and his antichrist and his whole organization, the super technology, come and take control of the ten regions of the earth they're going to divide us into, I am sure that they will they will kill all of the so-called Illuminati, you know, the the ones who have sold us out, because they are traitors and can't be trusted. And people will probably cheer for that and think, well, we've got rid of the bad guys when the real bad guy is deceiving us. And that's the great deception I'm thinking we're seeing. All of this has led up to that. Now we have to have a nuclear war or a threat of it in the Middle East so great that people will cry out, can someone make peace? And the Saudis are going to cripple the U.S. dollar and hence the global economy in the near future. They're setting it up now by trying to, to dump their shares in Aramco, the, the oil company. So how, how much time do you see? I mean, not to put a date on any of these. But, uh. <laughs> Everybody wants to know that, Casper. And, and all I can say, <laughs> I don't have a crystal ball either, but I'm just saying, uh, watch the news every day. Don't go to sleep on the news and current events. Fit them to biblical prophecy as best you can. And look out, you know, toward the end of this year, I think things are going to get very, very busy in in, in catastrophes facing the earth. Well, there's a lot of us in all, I mean, we're kind of in a, in a small group of people here in the whole, you know, prophecy guys and watchers on the wall. We're all kind of saying the same thing. We're all seeing the same thing. So we just want to help people prepare their hearts for what's coming and um, what the most important thing is, you know, getting your heart right, making peace with the Lord Jesus, Yeshua. Yes, absolutely. That That's your best protection because 
one way or another, we're all supposed to die, except those who get caught up in a rapture whenever that occurs. So prepare spiritually and then do the best you can to prepare, you know, physically with uh, things you may need, food, water, medicine, whatever, to endure a collapse of the economy for a short period of time. And you certainly don't want to be dependent on food, uh, meaning that you have to take uh, a number from the new Antichrist here. You don't want to have to be numbered to get food and water and stuff like that. So prepare for that kind of a situation as well. Just be practical about it. Well, we, you know, we serve a supernatural God, and I'm reminded um, as you're speaking this that, you know, Daniel 3, uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, I mean, they actually had to go into the fire at that point. We're not going to bow down, but then a, a miraculous thing happened. So I reckon anything that is in the scripture still applies to us today because our God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I would just encourage people, no matter what we're going through, that we just stay in faith and trust God for all the details. Yeah, no. yeah. Look, it does rank there, and as you said at the very beginning of the show, do not panic. You know, do not be given over to a spirit of fear. The scripture is telling you this so that you can know what's happening and not be frightened. Well, I think we're um, at the last moments of the program. So, your closing thoughts? Anything you'd like to to add here? Um, I, I can I can talk for you for hours and hours on all these things, but. Uh, <laughs> Well, we do that a lot on uh, yeah. a lot of fellows like yourself that we uh, share with, and uh, they share with us their findings. It's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. So I think the best thing is for people to not depend on their local pastor or some television preacher for all their input. Try to read and, and be worthy of your hire by our Lord in his uh, service. Educate yourself and be a good servant. That's the, the best thing other than being on board and, and having signed your life over to Christ as part of your walk with him. Um, that way you're assured even if you die of old age or, you know, uh, the Antichrist actions against you, whatever, where you're going in the next life is the most important other than hanging on and enduring uh, and helping others to come to the Lord while you are here. That's, that's my kind of major thought at the point. I would agree with you. So how can people get in touch with you? Because you, you've got so many fascinating things to, to share and encourage them to, to pick up a copy of your books. And um... Well, uh, my wife and I have a website called uh, standeo.com, S-T-A-N-D-E-Y-O.com. And we put uh, periodically put news items up there that Holly puts up. And uh, there's a link on that page to what's called the show images page that I update once or twice a week as I'm doing shows uh, with other hosts of where I put up current events and things that we're talking about that deal with prophecy and things that we need to be aware of. Um, oh, and on that homepage, we have uh, where our books are. You can click over uh, to our shopping cart and read about the Dare to Prepare book that Holly has written. It's about 632 pages. It's big. Um, Cosmic Conspiracy, which I first uh, wrote. Uh, the first edition was 1978. And now we're into the last final edition in 2010. And in there at the tail end, I've added about this alien UFO Satan uh, um, invasion, which, uh, and I tie it to eight scripture, eight uh, verses in Daniel, which uh, once you translate them are quite astounding to see what he said. Well, hopefully catch you up at the um, Rocky Mountain conference with all the rest of our mates, Gary Sturman and, Derek Gilbert and Ale Malzuli and old Avi Lukin. Who else is going to be? Bill Silas, you'll be speaking. So Chuck Are you Monster. going or are you going to do a live feed? Um, I, hopefully, um, I, I'll be there. We'll excellent, excellent. So, well, uh, I'll look you up then. We'll catch you up there. Thank you so much for being on the program tonight and I encourage everybody to check this out because it sounds just an amazing man, um, as you can hear from this program, and hopefully we'll get you back on sometime in the near future and we can delve into some more of this. Sure, in the, sure. In the meantime, stay tuned for Ale Marzuli. I um, just pray God's supernatural peace on everyone. If you need healing, we just ask the Lord to release healing and restoration into your life. Whatever you need, we just thank you, Father God, in Jesus Christ of Nazareth, almighty name, that you provide it. Amen and hallelujah. See you Amen. next week for another spiritual encounter. Thank you, Standeo, so much. <laughs> 